Their defense is a joke. What it really comes down to is I would love to have either of them. They don't have a, a prayer in their secondary. They have nothing. So you're saying just don't draft Blunt? I'm saying don't draft Blunt. He was unbelievably efficient last year. You know that they use their running backs in the passing game a ton. I'm drafting him tonight. That's Team Huevos. Huevos <laughs> <laughs> Gigantes. <laughs> Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. I'm joined, as always, by Mike Tagliere. You can find us on Twitter at KyleYNFL and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, how's it going, man? Oh, it's 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 weird because we're recording a podcast later than usual, but it's one that I'm actually excited about because I usually tell our guests that I can't stand recording late. But this one I'm excited about, man. Yeah, yeah. We made some uh, concessions here for these guests. We have an awesome show for you all today that's definitely different than our normal lineup. So today we have two awesome guests with us. We are joined by Matthew Hatchett, a former wide receiver who played for six seasons in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings, New York Jets, and Jacksonville Jaguars. You can find him on Twitter at Hatch89. Hatch, thanks for coming on the Fantasy Pros podcast. Oh, appreciate for having us, guys. I'm gonna get, you guys got your popcorn ready over there? Oh, we got it ready, man. We got <laughs> it ready. He stole the line already. <laughs> smart, smart folks. Our other guest for today is none other than NFL Hall of Fame wide receiver Terrell Owens. He played 16 seasons in the NFL and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2018. You can find him on Twitter at Terrell Owens. T.O., welcome to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. Thanks for having me. And it's uh, 15 seasons. 15 seasons. All right. I didn't want, I didn't want, <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll didn't want you his, to. I'll take his extra season. <laughs> There you go. I mean, did you get paid for it? That's the real question. Right, that's the question. A couple of seasons. Hey, that still won't be near easy, mine. Easy, easy, easy. <laughs> hey, did, did you guys? <laughs> did you guys see the, uh, the the Instagram post of me and T stats beside each other? Did you guys? Oh, see I that? did. Yeah, I, I did see that. And I also, T, you scored a touchdown against every NFL team. Is that true? Yes, sir. I'm very. I'm nice. I'm very talented. <laughs> that is a that's a remarkable that's accomplishment, a good man. Like when I saw that, I didn't even realize it, and I was like, "Whoo, yeah, that's that, something." That's a good stat. I give him that. Yeah, I, honestly, I didn't even know that had happened until like some years back, and somebody brought it to my attention, and I was like, "Damn, I'm good." You know, you <laughs> gotta say all that. No, I'm you just know, saying. I'm just saying. I, I honestly, like, I'm not one to toot my own horn. Yes, you are. I mean, that's you because can. perception <clears throat> says that. But again, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very humble guy that came from some humble beginnings. I uh, was raised, born and raised in Alexander City, Alabama, population under 15,000 people. And so for me to have accomplished what I've accomplished, and then, you know, I, I got a lot of fans across the country. And so for them to bring something like that, a stat like that to my attention, I was like, man, I almost had to pinch myself a couple of times. <laughs> and I was like, man, that, 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 that's, 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 a good, that's a good stat. Yeah. Like I, nobody has yeah. ever done that. I've, I've played in 31 out of the 32 cities of the NFL. Does that count? Is that a good stat? No, no, that's not even a <laughs> that's, stat. That's a good it's one. My, I mean, it's my stat, so it is a good stat. <laughs> Dude, my little stat. Dude, you know what, what, is, what are you? Hey, doing? Don't be hating on my little stat. You know Dude, what I'm saying? Dude, that's not the need. Hate on. That's not even. Oh, y'all go ahead. I'm not listening to that dude. Y'all go. Ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, man, guys, we are we are extremely excited to have you guys here. We love talking football here, so which I'm guessing is something that you guys enjoy too. So uh, we're just going to do that for a little bit here. I wanted to just start off the conversation here, guys, by asking you this. Obviously, we're a fantasy football podcast, and we have mm -hmm. people from all over the world that tune in to get an edge in their in their fantasy football league. So with that in mind, fantasy football has dramatically increased in popularity over the past decade, obviously. So what are your thoughts on fantasy football? I'll, I'll go to Hatch here first. What are your thoughts on fantasy football and the role that it's played in as we've seen the NFL's popularity rise? You know what? I, I made this statement about 10 years ago, and I said that fantasy football changed the trajectory of the NFL. If you look back yeah. to the late 90s, 99, 2000s, it was just becoming a thing, right? And, and then begin of 2000 exploded because you have a 13 year old girl in Tampa that never heard of the Seattle Seahawks. And she would be playing fantasy football and have somebody from the Seattle Seahawks. So now she's invested in learning about the Seattle Seahawks. And that time that happened, you know, a million times over. And that changed where all, everybody was invested in all 32 teams. And before that, it wasn't that. It was just, like I said, you live in Tampa, you like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you might have heard of the Miami Dolphins, but you, you only teams you know of are the teams that come into Tampa and play. 
But since, right. that, since the early 2000s, that changed the trajectory, in my opinion. Yeah, and just to piggyback uh, on that, I mean, you have um, a lot of these um, these everyday workers um, that have these pools and these fantasy pools. Um, you got females uh, competing against the guys. Uh, like I said, it, the, the engagement um, has, has increased uh, just tons. And just like, as Hatch said, it's just like you have – uh, just, I mean, not only from 13 year old kids, but you have like everyday just office workers, everyday workers that are now invested in football and fantasy football mm-hmm. uh, to the point to where, I mean, some of the football players are noticing um, because fans are, are getting upset because yeah, a, guy may, a guy <laughs> right. may get hurt uh, or, you know, have the you know potential to be playing the next week or, you know, he's sitting out. Um, he doesn't score a touchdown. Mm-hmm. All these things are factoring into their their fantasy football pool, and so it's just like it it has blown up tremendously to where, as you said, fantasy football is where it needs to be, where it is right now. Like you said, a hundred a million times mm-hmm. over than where where it was uh, twenty years ago. So um, I, I I'm not a big fan of fantasy football. I didn't really play it a lot, um, um, you know, when I played or even post football. Uh, yeah. I've been a lot of people's fantasies, uh, oh, but geez. other than, other than <laughs> that, keep it keep it football. Other keep it than football. Uh, I'm, I am keeping it football. I, I've been people's fantasies uh, to 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 score touchdowns on Sundays. So I, <laughs> it, 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 it it's 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 amazing how so invested these fans are with fantasy football to the point of where I mean they get upset to where yeah. like I said I mean I mean they have so much invested in the, the reward is so great that they get mad. Um, if a guy doesn't play, um, or doesn't a, even score, or if he like they might have six <laughs> catches for forty yards. They mad at that, right? right. If he right. doesn't score, and I, it was a it, for a while, I didn't know what what all the rules were with fantasy football. I didn't know how you got points. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, if you score touchdowns, then you get like a number of points. But I didn't know the I didn't know the algorithm for right. how the, how you get points. And so, obviously, yards is now a factor. I guess now catches everything, uh, it, tackles, uh, everything. Right. So I'm yep. like, this is this is amazing. Yep. Yep. I love it. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely come a long way, and they keep adding layers and layers and layers to the point where it's like you know we're trying to give everybody the edge that they can, and the further you deep you get into it, the more confusing it might be to someone that hasn't played. Uh, but Tio, that that was kind of the softball question to open things up, and I never thought I'd have the opportunity to ask you this question, but I'm going to because it's something that's that's irritated me for a long time. <laughs> Tony Romo was one of the most underrated quarterbacks of my life in terms of what I've watched. I'm not saying he was the greatest quarterback of all time, but I believe he was one of the most underrated quarterbacks of all time. Now I'm able to talk to you, someone who played with Tony Romo. Do you think that he belongs in the Hall of Fame conversation? We're hearing Eli Manning, who just retired, that he should be a shoe-in for the Hall of Fame. Tony Romo was a better quarterback. I mean, I I wanted to hear from you just how, just how underrated that he was. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think this is new to me. The fact that you know I'm hearing this narrative that he was underrated. Um, I think the knock on Tony was that he just he couldn't win the big games, or he didn't w- when the big games were, um, you know, um, in his hands or you know, at his grasp. Um, he didn't make the big plays. Um, it was all. It always sometimes come. It came down to the fourth quarter. And that's when he threw a lot of his interceptions. And I think he was trying to live up to the hype in which everybody looked at him to be, especially being a Dallas, uh, Dallas Cowboy quarterback. When you got that star on your helmet and you're playing for uh, America's, you know, considered greatest team, then there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And so at one point in time, like, yeah, he, he, he was a quarterback, the star of the team, the star of the city. Um, he's dating one of the, the hottest, um, you know, artists at the time, Jessica Simpson. So everything was just, you know, right at his fingertips. And I think um, at that time, like I said, he was like the, the hottest quarterback, you know, playing at that time. So, but the thing was, everybody was looking for Tony to, to, to win or get to the big game. And uh, we were never able to do that. And so, I mean, we did, it didn't happen when I was there. Um, and obviously when I left, it still didn't happen. And so, and then injuries started to plague him. And so he never really was able to really kind of live up to the expectations in which I think his own expectations. And so um, a lot are obviously a lot factors into that. But when you're a Dallas Cowboy quarterback and you're a quarterback of his caliber and you're not winning the games, then 
it's going to be tough um, for you to, I guess, you know, uh, live up to the billing. Um, but to to answer your question, is he a Hall of Fame quarterback? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have his stats in front of me. Um, but I, when you think about what Eli um, Manning did compared to what he did, I think he did a lot more with less um, if you look at it. Because you think about the teams that Tony Romo played with um, and, and the type of caliber and uh, players that he played with as well, um, you would think that he would have won a championship or at least gotten to, to deep into the playoffs, and that didn't happen. Yeah, and you made a comment again. Yeah, I wish you would have been there a little bit longer with him for sure. <laughs> What, how many how many years did Romo play? Mm, I don't know. Right? Oh, his total like play play was it like eleven? Was it like eleven seasons? Yeah, eleven. Oh, play play. That's a different story. Yeah, so that, that's like the part where I understood that part of the arguments. Because yeah. when, when he played, yeah. he, he played well. But I don't think the longevity is there. Number one. Number two. Again, you don't have the, the, the playoff game, wins. The playoff, playoff wins. wins Super Bowl. Too. And again, they, they're throwing this Hall of Fame around so much. You see, dude, a, you see a dude catch the ball on Sunday, and he has eight catches for two hundred yards. Oh, he's going to the Hall. Like, dude, pump your break, dude. It's crazy. They didn't. They didn't even let. They didn't even let uh, Eli Manning retire. Good. And they're already talking about Hall of Fame. That's like five years away. So, but, but and that's after Eli played mm-hmm. twelve. Right. Years. But I'm just saying. So but, imagine the guys that didn't even play that like this scenario. So I'm not sure where this whole I, – I just don't see it. He doesn't look like Dan Marino when he throws the ball, right? It's just he didn't look like Who that. Is this? Tony Romo. He didn't look like Dan Marino, right? No. And if you put the numbers up against um, Hall of Fame quarterbacks, it's because he's in the modern era quarterback, so he's got numbers. But right. greatest, you know, when you're talking about Hall of Fame, you're talking about the greatest to ever do it, and if he's in the top 20 ever – I, I just can't put him in that category. I, I just not right now. No, I not mean, right. that's I, fair. No. And I play with him, and I can, I, I can completely, totally agree with you. Um, yeah, and, and, and now I think, you know, it's one of these things. Now he's in the media. Will that help him get into the Hall of yep. Fame? It has helped I some. Hope so though. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't. That's not fair. Right, but it fair. has helped some other people get into the Hall of Fame that has yeah. some questionable, mm-hmm. um, questionable past. Yeah, you look like Troy That's Aikman, fair. Terry Bradshaw, Brett Favre, Dan Marino, Joe Montana, Warren Moon. I just can't put him in that category. I, I think the closest one no, fit, is would yeah. only be Steve, or would only be Kurt Warner, and Kurt Warner had some amazing big games and big playoff games. So I yeah. probably put mm-hmm. him over the top. But you know, Romo yeah. never even did that, you know. And I think the Kurt Warner was a stretch until he got in the media. Right, like I said, sometimes mm-hmm. being in the media kind of, I guess, puts just pushes you over the hump. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And I, I, I agree with you guys on that. Now, in in current today NFL, who is the best wide receiver in the game right now, according to you guys? Who would Julio you say Jones. that is? Julio Jones and uh, I'd say Antonio Brown. I, I don't put Antonio in that category because he took a year off, and we don't know. Matter. He said right now because he's not on a roster, he can't be <laughs> in the conversation. <laughs> And a, a cl- my 1A is DeAndre Hopkins before Antonio Brown because we know he's ball- been balling the last three, four years, and he's going to have another and four, I'll five. Th- and I'll throw years. Devontae Adams in there as yeah. well. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And Michael Thomas. I like Hopkins. I like Hopkins yeah. that you're mentioning the, him there too because he's been balling for the past few years, but he's been balling without Deshaun Watson previously. Yeah. Some of the guys right, that he's been playing with guys, before that. They don't, they don't have the personality as some of these others, so they kind of just get lost in the shuffle. They don't people forget about them it's like they have to do something besides just put up big numbers right um in order to kind of get you know constantly consistently uh recognized um if you look at deandre hopkins yeah i mean um his statistics and and the way he plays is is off the charts um but he's not being mentioned because you think of you know what Michael Thomas is doing there with the New Orleans Saints and Drew Brees, like yeah, he's <laughs> like a hundred, almost a hundred and fifty something catches, bro. That's that's, that's crazy. Of. Yeah, that's unheard of. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think Hatch has 150 catches in two seasons. <laughs> no, my, my career. Maybe his career. <laughs> that's terrible. That is, shut up. <laughs> that is terrible. <laughs> Uh, and so this dude is doing it in one season, dude. In one season. I don't do. I had one season where I had a hundred catches, and that's it. But here, here's what bothers me about the perception of 140 catches means you're a Hall of Famer. No, it doesn't. Because no. when we were playing, you had eight targets, you had seven targets, but you had six catches. 
It, like now you get targeted 20 times a game and you end up with eight catches. I, I'm not that impressive because you had so, so many, many targets. targets. Yeah. You know, but, but there's a lot of things. Me. I mean, right. and, and obviously they could, it, that's a bit skewed because, again, you can have 20 targets, but how many of those were catchable, catchable balls? balls? How many was on target? Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's where, again, if there's a little ambiguity in there. Right, you guys didn't play with Drew Brees. I mean, if you played with Drew Brees, you know, let's let's say that 150 was possible. Oh, no doubt. In today's <laughs> game, yeah, absolutely. Again, there's no contact in today's game. You're not going over the middle, worry about getting your head cut off. Uh, you know, you can't jam at the line of mm-hmm. scrimmage. It's just a way, you know, yeah. uh, friendlier, pass happy league as well. And of course, that plays into it. And again, yeah. when I, again, I was on the '98 Vikings when we scored all them points, but we mm-hmm. did it without. You know, going no huddle. We were still huddling. We were still, we just had, still had a normal offense, and we probably <laughs> had maybe 55, 60 plays a game. Now these teams are getting up to 75, 80 offensive plays a game. Like that helps a lot. When you talk yeah, about stats right. and chances, you know, opportunities, you know, up the bat, basically. Yeah, well, we're talking about some of the best wide receivers in the game, guys, and and we've got some great wide receivers coming up in this NFL draft. And so, one of the main things that Tags and I do here is is scouting these guys coming out of you know Clemson to Alabama to you know these Jerry larger Judy. schools and saying how can they train Jerry Judy, oh, man? How so can they good. translate to the NFL? So, I wanted to get ask you guys this, uh, both of your opinions here. So, um, we've got some great wide receivers coming in. What's the one trait that you think leads to success in the NFL? If a player has this one thing, you know, if is, is it great route running? Is it, uh, um, you know, what is it? They're more likely to make an impact in the NFL. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, I think the, I guess the misconception about, uh, a receiver, I think is of their chances of making it to the league. I think it's, it's speed, although that's the name of the game. The game is predicated on speed. When it, as it relates to a receiver, I think it's it's all about route running, um, being able to run route, uh, run routes, and then separate. And it's that uh, it's sort of like the stance and start um, of the position. You know, it's uh, obviously you got to get off uh, the line of scrimmage, get into your routes, uh, and if you can separate, um, because there are some great defensive backs, and so when you uh, once a defensive back studies you, uh, they have film on you, then your game is going to have to evolve and it's going to have to change uh, to where you can get open. You can't just run a route just as it looks like on, uh, as it looks on paper. How can you set the defensive back up? How can you get into his uh, break break down his cushion um, and separate? And so I think that that's going to be the key. I think a lot of these guys, um, their their talent is so superior. Of those in uh, of of the teams that they play in college, yep. that they can get away with certain things um, in college where they're not going to be able to get away with it uh, in, in in the pro at the pro level. Mm-hmm. I would say, for me personally, if I'm looking at a receiver, it comes down to the, the playmaking ability, and usually that starts with a contested ball. Like in college, mm-hmm. they, they can run right by other DBs because the kid is 19 years mm-hmm. old. You, you know, he's a baby still, and this kid might be 21. Um, or he can run a slant and then, like, you know, just make a safety miss because he's just physically better. But when you get to the next level, the only ones that can catch the ball over and over again are ones who are making contested catches. And I think that's a big thing um, with the what general manager and pro personnel people look at when they look at body types because most of those catches are, you know, big bodies who can make a contested catch. You, you rarely see a small receiver make contested catches. So when you do, that makes that, that kid special. The Steve Smith of the world was special at his size because he made mm-hmm. big 6'3 type catches. Um, so, again, I think for me that's the right. biggest thing, a contested catch because you're going to be contested nine out of ten times when you're talking about on the NFL level, especially when you're younger. You can be as fast as you want, but if you don't, you don't have wiggle to get away from every DB every single week. They're always going to be on your back and they're running routes with you. Yes, yeah, it boils down to can you can you make play? Are yep. you a playmaker? Yep. Um, and then, at, you know, from a playmaker, um, you involve to where, you know, are you a game changer? Mm-hmm. And that, those are, when you think about guys with playmaking ability and game changing ability, um, I automatically think of Julio Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the type of guys that, you know, will forever, like, um, you know, evolve. Um, and take the take the game where it needs to be, and 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 keep the elite receivers hungry. I mean, they're still they 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 set the bar uh, for a lot of these guys that are in college now. 
um, that are looking up to uh, receivers to, to, to be and play like, um, just like a Calvin Johnson. Um, he's a game changer. Mm-hmm. He, he's not only just a playmaker, he, he's, he has the, the ability mm-hmm. um, with this play catching, uh, his catch, uh, catch radius uh, Crazy. To, to be able to change the game at any given time. And so, again, as Hatch said, I mean, yeah, you're gonna have, you can have a lot of kids that can run routes. Right. Um, but can you, you know, can you get open? Can you separate? Um, those are the ones that, that, that separate themselves from being, you know, obviously at the you know, top, being top, you know, five, ten pick uh, to, you know, uh, being drafted, you know, on the second day. Right. And yeah. T.O., I heard you say I heard you say Jerry Judy. So are you a fan of this kid? Um, yeah, I, I worked out with uh, Jerry and a number of those guys, even Calvin Ridley be- before he came out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm from mm-hmm. Alabama. I'm an Alabama fan. Um, I have some ties, uh, some relationships uh, on staff there. And so um, uh, I took my 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 son a, a few years back. I took my son and my two nephews to uh, the Alabama camp. And so I uh, just went there just to kind of check up on them. And so um, those guys wanted me to stay after to run some routes and stuff with them. They were like, man, can you run some routes with us, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, I was like, I, I, I wasn't even prepared. I'm like, I don't even have my ties. They don't have my, my shooters. Like, oh, we got you. We got you. So um, they said they, they were trying to get <laughs> – so they called up, and I was like, all right. And I was like, y'all give me some tights and some shoes. I'm good. And so uh, they were trying <laughs> to reach Jalen uh, Jalen Hurts, who was, uh, who was on the team at the time. And so um, they couldn't locate Jalen. And so they was like, well, I was like, well, all right. I was like, I'm gonna be out then. I was like, no, no, no. They're like, man, we got a, uh, we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get the freshman uh, quarterback um, that's backing him up. We're gonna get Tua. And I'm like, who? They tried to say his, uh, they said his name <laughs> Tua Tagovailoa. I was so tongue tied. I'm like, who? Tua tight? What? He tied his shoes on too, what? Too tight. What? <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't pronounce the guy's name for nothing in the world. And so I stayed. So. Uh, Tua comes out, and so they basically gave me the spiel on Tua. They're like, man, he's straight out of high, you know, obviously freshman, uh, true freshman. They're like, dude, they're like, this guy's going to be the real deal. They're like, he's a left-hander. And I'm like, really? I'm like, he's good? And uh, they're like, yeah, but you'll see. Dude, I sat out there. I mean, I, we we waited on him. Uh, we warmed up. And so uh, I ran pretty much every route that I could run. And so I didn't hold anything back. I'm like, okay, let me see what this kid is about. Uh, I know we're talking about Jerry, but let me get on Tua for a second because Tua, yeah, he, dude, I saw he only, I only corrected Tua on one on one route, and it wasn't that bad. Um, it was the bang eight, and so if you know anything about a bang eight, um, it's it's, uh, it's a route where you on your fourth outside step, you're basically running a skinny post, and on that fourth outside step. Uh, when you hit that four side side step, you're looking inside. The ball should all be, obviously be halfway there. Um, it's where you're throwing. You know, the ball is going to be caught um, right inside uh, uh, the, the, the safety in, in the corner. And so he threw the ball, and it was a little behind me. And I saw him throw the ball. And so when I came back, you know, I caught the ball, ran back to him, and I said, "Two, I said, I said on this route right here, I said, dude, that's like." I shouldn't see you throw the ball. I said, that ball should be already halfway to me. So at this point, like I said, I've mm-hmm. run square outs. I've run slant. I've run digs. I've run overs. Like, every ball was on point. The the bang gate was the only one that I corrected him on. And when I corrected him on that, dude, I didn't see a ball hit the ground. And we was out there for like an hour and a half, like drenched in That's sweat. Awesome. So there was humidity. It was about 90 degrees. And I was like, and when I left there, when I left that campus, I was like, this dude is the real deal. I'm like, dude, I've never seen. I'm like, I said, this dude right here can throw better than some pros that I pl- that I've had throw to me. I'm like, where, right, as a I'm freshman. Like, where did this kid come from? So and then, Hawaii. man, and I'm like, and so it, it, was just, it was he blew. <laughs> honestly, he blew me away. And so uh, it didn't surprise me with the success that I've seen him have. Um, uh, hopefully, he recovers from this hip injury. Um, so. And then you think about the the receivers that you know, we're talking about, Jerry Judy. Obviously, Cavern really went on to be drafted with with the Atlanta Falcons. I knew he was going to be uh, the real deal there. And so you talk about uh, Jerry Judy, who obviously played behind those guys. Um, this guy right here, um, I mean, he can run every route um, possible. Um, I mean, the sky's the limit for this guy. Um, he has all the ability in the world. Um, we've run routes uh, together. 
Um, he's asked me a bunch of questions. I've even you know, called him. And I've watched some games, and I've kind of just you know critiqued him and asked him. Even when he's had drops, you know, I called him. I saw uh, on a like an over route or something that he ran or a slant um, that I was watching in the game, and I texted him like, and I, I just shot him some questions. I'm like, yo, do you know why you do you know why you dropped this ball? You know, I'm like, how can you mm-hmm. uh, better run this route? And so he would give me some feedback or what have you, but. Um, this guy is going to be 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 a, 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 a force to be reckoned with when he gets in that league. That's awesome. That's a hell of an answer. I mean, in, in to, to go from Judy into Tua, that that story in itself is amazing as a freshman, and you saying that he had that much talent. I mean, I, definitely this this injury to the hip. You know, it's got a lot of teams concerned, but it seems like right. actually today they were saying that he's cleared all his medical protocol and he's going to throw for teams before the draft. So um, oh. fingers crossed for that kid. That cause that sounds. I mean. Taking your word for that, that sounds Oh, you know, dude, let me tell you something. Fantastic. He would be the number one pick. I don't care what Joe Burrows has done. Great guy, won championship, looked good, played well in that system, had some guys to make some plays for him, heck of a player. But let me tell you something. If Tua was 100% healthy, if I'm starting a team, I'm going with Tua Tagovailoa Loa with the number one <laughs> pick. In the 2020 NFL draft, because this did trust me, this guy's the real deal, and I'm not. I saw it with my own eyes. I'm sure I'm I, glad you're not picking the number one pick, then, buddy. Who's that? I said I'm glad you're not. Picking if he the was 100 percent healthy, like I'm saying, if he was 100 <laughs> percent healthy, I don't. I get what you're saying. Like obviously, the injury is going to be a concern. But like I said, even with that being a concern, um, I still would take him. I, I, I'll still take 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 him at a, at a high pick. Now, obviously, like I said use that year to obviously continue to get healthy and while he's doing that again he's going to be learning uh behind uh, some court some some veteran mm-hmm. quarterback yeah I, I don't think it's uh, i don't even think it's part of the consideration again once he gets cleared he needs, if he doesn't go to mini camp in may big deal you know he'll be healthy right. by august when training camp really starts he shouldn't be starting week one anyway like, the, I don't think the injury is part of it. Now, if you're saying, well, they don't want him because he's injury prone because he's been injured three times in two years, then that's something totally different. But I don't think any yeah. real team at evaluation is worried about that one particular injury right now. Well, they said the same thing about D.K. Metcalf, you know, coming out of, uh, was it Ole Miss? Oh, um, yes, so, yep. yeah, I mean, so look what and, – and obviously that injury that is, is a significant injury too. Like when you talk about uh, dealing with the neck, um, mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, this is a, a similar injury. I don't, I don't, I'm not a doctor, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to diagnose. Okay, the severity, which which injury is more severe? But mm-hmm. you, both of them have their um, have the their issues. Yeah, yeah, sure. the pros and cons of those injuries. So, um, you know, I think you know, look at the way that DK Met, uh, DK Metcalf has come out and played, and and obviously, like I said, you know, he had to you know go through the questions of. You know, was he going to be healthy? Um, he was labeled uh, being injury, injury prone, prone yep. uh, as well. Um, but I, I, I honestly, like I said, me knowing Tua, um, and again, just the fact he's a man of faith, man of God. Like I know that he's going to come out on the other side of this. I just, I mean, I just, I just feel it in my bones. So uh, just yeah. know when he, it's not when he steps on the scene and he gets his opportunity. The thing is, his he's head and shoulders above so many guys. Just at, at the way that he obviously dissects and he reads defenses and, and just his ability to get the, the way his ball, the, the delivery is and how quick he gets the ball out of his hands. Um, these, I mean, he had a pro um, outset um, demeanor um, even at the collegiate level. So nice. you can only imagine, um, yeah, and even in high school, you can only imagine um, what it's going to be once he gets around those paroles and, 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 and adjust to the speed of the game um, at, the, at, the, at the NFL level. Yeah, no. That's, I mean, that's a great answer. And I think it's a good segue, too, because you said you mentioned DK Metcalf, and he was someone I really did like him. There were a lot of people with question marks about him, loved him, and then he fell into a situation with Russell Wilson and the Seahawks that it was, I think that was the best case scenario for him. He had a chance to get in right away. Uh, you know, that, that route tree that was t- was limited, and I'm putting that in quotes. Um Russell Wilson made it work, and he kind of does that. And that leads me to my question to ask you guys, what matters most to a wide receiver's success in the NFL? Is it? Do you believe it's coaching scheme? Do you believe it's strictly target opportunity? Or do you think it's their quarterback? What, what would you say the, the most important trait is or situation is to a wide receiver's success? Well, I think it's kind of twofold. I mean, you got to obviously be put in the right situation. Um, but again, you can have all the ability in the world, and if you have a shitty quarterback, then that's a lot of talent. For nothing, um, your yeah, skill set is not going to be on display like you need it to be. If you're struggling, or if your offensive line 
is not protecting the quarterback and he's not able to go through his reads to actually get you the ball. So um, obviously situation, um, the structure um, has a lot to do with it, which is the opportunities. Um, but you have to have um, – you've got to have a quarterback at, at the same time. There's a lot of factors that, that go into becoming uh, an elite receiver when you have elite talent because you've got to have some elite talent around you or somebody, you know, a little bit more than elite uh, getting, you know, uh, getting you the football. Yeah, I, I would say and it, it, could, it be, depends on what your definition of success is because, okay, if you draft the receiver in the first round, and he doesn't go to the Pro Bowl in his first three years, and then he goes behind another team his fourth year and then goes to the Pro Bowl five years from years five through ten, he's still a successful receiver. You, you right. know what I'm saying? But people want it all right now. They're like, okay, we dropped yep. him in the first round. He's got to go to the Pro Bowl. It doesn't usually work like that. You know? And then the second part, again, yeah, what are you surrounded with? Because very few receivers are going to be drafted, and you can be a number one in a system and be successful. You're, you're not going to be a rookie and go up against veteran all pro corners and then get two safety, the second safety rolled over the top and have success. It's just not going to happen. So the best case scenario that I've seen in a long time, is kind of the, the Randy Moss, Chris Carter scenario. Even Randy was a number three. He wasn't even a number two, but um, the Calvin Ridley scenario going with Julio, Julio gets all the double coverages. So um, Calvin Ridley is just eaten. <laughs> you know, his numbers are yeah. crazy, but they're only crazy because Julio's getting a double team. So what's your definition? Is who, and because some people who don't know ball, they're going to be like, well, Julio's better, um, Calvin Ridley's better than Julio because he had more touchdowns. No. <laughs> Calvin's getting all single coverage. He's getting no. the nickel guy. You know what I'm saying? So it just kind of depends. There's too many variables to, to a wide receiver being successful in the NFL. There's probably about another 50 that I could go over, actually, so. Yeah. Yeah. I love those answers guys. Well, my final question here for you guys is, uh, what's this podcast thing you've got going on? I know, uh, I've heard a little bit about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about here about, uh, get your popcorn ready. Um, so yeah, basically it's a platform, um, for me and T to talk about sports, entertainment, and pop culture. Like we didn't want to get on and just talk about have an ASPN interview. Yeah. The chiefs went cover too. So they ran a draw on third down. Like we think there's more to the athlete than just football. And when we were playing, yeah. we like to branch out and, you know, do other things, let people know we have more talent than just being a football player. So we like to get on the show and bring, bring guests and celebrities on the show and let them tell, tell us about their lives, you know, their lifestyle, being married, having kids. Uh, like we had a host on, uh, his name is Bill Bellamy. And he's talking about, a, he's guest. A, yeah. a guest, I'm sorry. And um, he's talking about, he's the carpool dad. You know, and just letting people into these, these uh, celebrities and, and athletes' lives and letting them know they're regular people, number one. Number two, they're coming from somewhere of a real place. When they were young, they just had dreams like anybody else, and they get to tell their story about how they became successful, like their ambitions and some of their fears and things of that sort. And we just wanted a platform that kind of stated all that for the celebrity athlete. And, you know, that's kind of what we're about. It's not about just football. Like we'll have base, we have baseball people on, basketball, football, actors, actresses, Olympians, skateboarders, people doing <laughs> art, you know. And, again, it's just kind of giving everybody, a, a, you know, in a, kind of like a, a sneak peek of people's lives. Like, you can do anything you want in this world. And we're, we're here. We're, again, two small-town kids that played our dreams out in the NFL. And then life's not over because the NFL is over, you know, what we did is not who we are. And like I said, we want people to have that understanding of athletes are doing a lot of things these days. They're not just, you see them on Sunday, there's 16 games, but that means there's 350 something odd days left of the year. So these guys are doing a lot of, you know, cool stuff. We would like for them to be able to tell their story and use a platform like ours. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome, guys. I know that that one is going to be on my regular subscribe because uh, you guys definitely have a lot of chemistry together, and you uh, are not Thanks, afraid bro. to give it to <laughs> give it to one another if you think they're wrong. So, no. I, uh, I mean, I'm definitely I'm looking. Cut you off right there, but we we clown a lot on this show, so we, we do want under, people to understand. Yet we're not on here taking stuff personal. We're having fun. Yeah. Life is fun. We're enjoying yep. it. People, oh my God, he said such and such about. I'm like. We're, we're having fun, people <laughs> out, out there. They, people got to relax. You know what I'm saying? We're just having a good time. Mm-hmm. Right. This is yeah, what absolutely. people never knew really about me anyway. They don't really know him. See what I'm saying? They don't know him, <laughs> I'm punch him in the but, face they, that. but they know me. <laughs> so everybody has this, this perception of me that I was, 
you know, we talked about it earlier, like I'm some selfish, arrogant guy. Um, but like I said, on the football field, again, I never really talked a lot of trash. If you really think about it, the only time that anybody heard anything about me and for it to be deemed, I guess, trash talk is that, you know, you heard the sideline, the side, the sideline sound bites. Bite. Um, they never mm-hmm. saw me or heard. I was never mic'd up during the course of a game where I was talking trash to anybody. And I was mic'd up a few times. Uh, I mean, you have to be somebody to be mic'd up. So this is the only time Hatch is being mic'd up right now. So he gets to talk. <laughs> so um, I, I, outside of that, um, again, this is what people really don't know. I'm pretty chill. I'm reserved. I'm laid back. There's a lot of people they'll tell you, like, man, he's quiet. He doesn't really say much. Um, even when I've just kind of described describe myself to my kids and I'm like, yo, I don't really say a whole lot. I really wasn't this type of guy. But they Google me and they, they see highlights and they hear sound bites and they're like, what? You don't talk? But yeah, I'm just <laughs> a real chill guy. I'm, 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 I'm kind of funny. I don't try funny. to, He's I don't, not funny, I don't though. try That's to be problem. funny. <laughs> you know, I don't try to be funny, but people are like, man, oh my God, it's like, man, we like listening to you with the, even with the episodes that we've, uh, that we've shot, everybody's like, man, you're funny, man, you guys, as you just mentioned too, like, man, you guys have, you know, great chemistry together, this and that, and yeah, they're like, yeah, you're very funny, they're like, the other guy, he's funny looking, so, <laughs> it's, you know what I mean, so, that's, 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 that's uh, how it is, that's, that's get your popcorn ready. You know what they go say, haters go hate, you know how that goes, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, but I, I, even from this interview, though, T.O., it sounds like you're a good mentor as well, reaching out to guys like, like Calvin Ridley, Judy, you know, doing workouts with those guys. Oh, so, yeah, uh, but that's what I, I've been doing throughout the course of my career but you know the media they're not gonna they're not, oh, they don't they're show not that gonna stuff. talk about that um, right yeah I, I, for, I would, for whatever reason you know they're they'll they'll rather uh do a story on a peyton manning or somebody like that that, sh- that put you rather know, put them in a positive light versus somebody like me and it's not like they can't find a story um where i've right. done something similar if not better than what he's done but that's just the way it is so yeah, I've I've been on the you know on the Nike circuit, you know, working with these guys in high school for like years upon years. So we would always have workouts with high school players, and then when they get to college, and I would always have T come. And again, it's when we do stuff like that. There's no cameras around. We're just there getting some real work in, building real relationships. And again, sometimes we had workouts with twenty you know wide receivers who are you know right. in the league now. And then sometimes it was just yeah. two or three. So it wasn't about, well, this is the big time and bring cameras out. It's just like we don't really talk about stuff like that. We're just going to be genuine and, you know, say give people the knowledge. And, of course, that's not what people want to hear all the time. They want to hear some negative stuff. So Right. But even like, as you said, some of the guys that have created these camps and they have football players coming in and and doing things, they're they're putting them at the forefront, like the Elite 7 or these Elite Elite 11. 11. Like Jordan Palmer, I'm not talking mess about him. I play with Jordan, but it's like, oh, Jordan is giving back to the kids. They're doing a special on him of what he's doing, mentoring. Dude, I've done the same thing with a number of counts, B2BG, whatever. B2G. Yeah, B2G, that, yeah. Like, I've done so many things, but like I said, I, I never did it for, for any publicity. Um, definitely wasn't doing it to try to gain any popularity, um, but that's just the, the way it is. At the end of the day, I know my blessings are going to come. Um, that's why we're doing this podcast to, to, to show people we can do more than uh, what we're being right what and, and what we're giving credit for so um, other than that um, like I said you know Hatches has been a, been a great friend of mine um, like I said you, you guys hear the dynamic you hear the chemistry and again we just want to share a little bit of our world while people come on, our, come, on, come on our show and share a little bit of their world to us get your popcorn ready podcast Get your popcorn ready. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on. That's all the time we have for today. Again, a huge thank you to Hatch and T.O. for coming on the podcast. Remember to follow them on Twitter at Hatch89 and at Terrell Owens. You can find Mike and I on Twitter also at KyleYNFL and at Mike Taglier NFL. For Hatch, T.O., and Tags, I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.